Good morning. Thank you for taking time to join us again for worship this Sunday morning. Just a couple of announcements. Announcement one is to invite everyone who's listening to please be a part of our Zoom coffee hour, which happens at 945, immediately following this liturgy. Login credentials were sent via the parish e-news yesterday on Saturday. But if for some reason you did not receive the e-news and you want to join in on the Zoom coffee hour, if you will text me at my cell phone number, 414-899-9004, I will send you uh, login information so you can participate in today's Zoom coffee hour. Again, my cell number to text me to get credentials to log in, 414-899-9004. I'd also like to express my thanks for parishioners who are taking part in today's liturgy. Christy Bonney, who is our elector, Patrick McSweeney, who is our intercessor, and Amanda Robison, who is serving as our cantor and soloist today. It's a delight to be sharing the worship of God with these fellow ministers. One more announcement, and that is to be on the lookout. We are currently meeting with wardens and thinking about all things relative to the revision of the Way Forward Task Force reopening plan. And while we're not clear about the details yet, we are committed that come Sunday, July the 19th, there will be an opportunity for people to drive to church and receive communion in their cars. It's not perfect, but that's where we're headed so that we can get some in-person interaction. You'll be hearing more about that in the tidings and probably in a letter from me or the wardens. But be assured we're working on it. That's our goal, is that we'll be able to distribute communion to people in their cars come July the 19th, and that can't come soon enough. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for your continued prayers. And now let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
A reading from the letter to the Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means do you know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, are of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to you which you were entrusted, that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater inequity. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been free from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the lesson.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. At the beginning of the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gathers his 12 closest followers. They've already been with him for some length of time. They've witnessed his ministry of healing and exorcism. They've heard him proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, completely out of the blue, Jesus gets real with them. Okay, guys, it's time you had some OJT, on-the-job training. Jesus tells them, He's sending them out. He tells them what he wants them to do. He also tells them some of what's likely to happen when they do it. There's an urgency to the message of the good news that simply will not wait. It won't wait until they're ready. Jesus gives the twelve the authority to act on his behalf even though they don't have all their stuff together. Even though they were mostly confused about some of the things Jesus had been saying. Even though they were going to bumble along. And even though they were going to likely fail more than they would succeed. Jesus tells them, in effect, now it's your turn. Go and do what you've seen me do. Go and preach what you've heard me preach. Go from village to village and receive whatever hospitality is offered to you. And if hospitality isn't offered, well, don't abandon the mission. Shake the dust off of your feet and move on. I can only imagine how overwhelming Jesus' words must have sounded. As I've tried to put myself in the disciples' sandals while reading the 10th chapter of Matthew over and over again this week, I've had my own responses to some of what Jesus tells them. I'm sending you out like sheep to the wolves. Nice metaphor, Jesus, but this makes me really uncomfortable. Have you seen what wolves do to sheep? You'll be flogged and dragged before the authorities. Lord, you never said anything about torture or jail time. You will be betrayed and hated. Uh, ex excuse me, but I thought this was good news about love and inclusion. Your family will abandon you. But my family, why, they're the most important people in my life. Do not fear those who can kill the body. Wait, I didn't know the possibility of dying was included in this travel package. 2,000 years 
after the fact. Those of us who live under the aegis of affluence in places of privilege and safety have likely heard most of what Jesus says to the twelve here as metaphorical. In much of middle-class American culture, culture, the gospel we hear week by week, that gospel doesn't challenge our assumptions about our own identity or the way the world works or how we're called to embody our faith on a daily basis. We're not worried about a violent encounter with the authorities. Because our religion is held so privately, it's hardly ever seen in the public square. We do not fear abandonment, betrayal, or hatred because of our religion. I think that's probably because we've not fully understood the demands faith in Jesus makes upon our loyalties, our relationships, our economics, and our politics in the first place. But make no mistake, the mission Jesus sets before the twelve, that's our mission as well. To engage with this mission is to put ourselves in places of dependence, where we give up our needs for predictability, safety, and control. To participate in the gospel mission, we will need to depend on God. We will need to depend on each other. We will need to depend upon the hospitality of strangers. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus says in today's reading. Because of the way the lectionary slices and dices Scripture, Most of us have likely heard those words of Jesus, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, as a call for us to be the hospitable ones. And we Episcopalians, well, we've lived into this ideal in countless ways. We're always ready to prepare lunches for the poor, to provide clothing for those who need it, to make our church spaces available to 12-step groups of every sort, to plant community gardens and countless other initiatives. But all of these efforts, as necessary and generous and laudable as they are, all of these efforts arise from our own abundance. We're the ones offering a controlled hospitality, and we're rarely the ones needing to take the risk to receive hospitality from others. Jesus pushed the disciples to undertake work they likely would not have volunteered to do on their own. They weren't going to be perfect. They were going to make mistakes. They would fail spectacularly. But they needed to get started anyway. And so do we. Since mid-March, many of us have wrestled with what it means to worship God and serve Jesus when we don't have the benefit of gathering in person at the sacred spaces we hold dear. We may have felt at a loss for how to live our faith without the benefit of the encouragement simply being with our fellow parishioners brings us week after week. And if the pandemic weren't enough, the protests of the last month and the continued fracturing of our collective public discourse, that all adds to our angst. These are difficult times indeed. And the mission of Jesus remains the same. Our world needs to hear the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Our world needs to see this reality lived out by a people so formed by the gospel we cannot help but to confront 
the demons of greed and hatred and violence and injustice which seek to destroy the dignity of every human being. Our world needs our imperfect and sometimes clumsy faithfulness because even the most modest, the most tentative of our efforts give witness to our refusal to accept the world as it is. Even in our confusion, we are still called. Even in our weariness, we are still called. Even in our anxiety and uncertainty, we are still called. Jesus is still inviting us to join him in his holy work of feeding, healing, and raising the dead. Our gospel work, sisters and brothers, well, it may not lead to anything like what our culture names as a, as a success. Sometimes what we do will amount to little more than offering a cup of water in Jesus' name. Other times, what we do will amount to little more than receiving a cup of water in Jesus' name. Sometimes we will be the ones welcoming others in unexpected ways. And sometimes we will be the ones who are welcomed into unexpected places. But rest assured, people of God, a cup of water and a word of welcome will be enough. Maybe even enough to completely change the world as we thought we knew it. Amen.
Let us affirm the articles of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which you will find either in your service bulletin or on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people this morning will be following Form 4, found on page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer. Page 388. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all of your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us, good Lord under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick and lift up all who are brought low, that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Help us eliminate the cruelties, large and small, which are inflicted every day upon those who are marginalized, overlooked, 
and forgotten. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equitable opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land and use our resources rightly through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let us pray in the words our Savior Christ has taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Always remember that life is short, and we only have so much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the road with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, be slow to anger, and rest assured that God is infinitely more concerned with the promise of your future than the mistakes of your past. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.